Today on Public Eye News, an FDA inspection found problems at the factory making Johnson & Johnson vaccines, and a teenager in Ohio was shot and killed by the police. Later, I'll be back with your weather, and Max Stevens will have your sports. Hi, I'm Nate Jacobs. And I'm Scott Minshaw, and this is Public Eye News. The North Coast Dance Festival hosted by Northern Michigan University will kick off tomorrow night and last for the following three days. The festival will feature NMU students, the NMU dance team, and even some NMU faculty members. One of the dances has even been choreographed to an original score by the school's music department. The event will not have an in-person audience, but will be live streamed for those who purchase tickets. Tickets can be found online at Northern's ticketing website, nmu.universitytickets.com. Northern Michigan University's own Kelly G. Cooper has been named the 2021 recipient of the Dorothy Ludwig Excellence in Teaching Award at the post-secondary level. Cooper, who teaches French and Russian at Northern, will be honored at the next American Association of Teachers of French convention. She has spent 20 years teaching here at Northern and, according to the school, has reimagined the French program in a number of ways. She has also made strides in increasing the number of students in the French program over her time teaching. Cupper has been praised for her efforts of including the academic service learning in the French program and partnering with local schools and businesses. According to Michigan Live, the historic Keweena Lodge in the Keweena Peninsula is applying to become the UP's first international dark sky park. Coordinators of the lodge began the process of becoming a park a few months ago and are hoping they can be approved as early as this summer. A spokesperson for the lodge says the application makes sense as the lodge is so far away from any light pollution and it makes a fantastic place to view things such as the northern lights. The lodge has been making changes to their buildings recently to prepare for being named a dark sky park. Employees and, local and the local community support the plan and application with the hope that it will be beneficial to everyone. Executive Order No. 21-5 was signed into effect today by Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer according to WLUC-TV. The executive order outlines the new jail reform advisory council. Whitmer commented it will, quote, play a critical role in implementing long overdue reforms to our justice system, end quote. The governor went on to state how the order will help keep our communities safer and help save taxpayers' dollars. A year ago in April 2019, Whitmer signed a similar executive order, but due to rising jail populations and high costs, she made a reform. The task force assigned suggested changes that included traffic violations, arrests and sentencing, and probation and parole, to name a few. Chief Justice Bridget Mary McCormick will serve as the chair on the council, among a multitude of other appointments. And the state of Michigan has recently unveiled their plans to spend their federal COVID-19 relief aid. A proposed bill on Tuesday highlighted using the allotted $1.6 billion on roads, water, and broadband infrastructure. Half of the federal aid must go towards schools, local governments, child care, food and rental assistance, and coronavirus testing and vaccines. These funds are non-discretionary. This leaves roughly $5.7 billion to be used towards pandemic relief and economic fallout. Governor Gretchen Whitmer was assisted by the Republican-led legislator after discussions in December were halted over disagreements. Other aspects of the aid will go towards unemployment, mental health assistance, and debt repayment from the Flint water crisis. And if you live downstate, you may not want to pack up your winter gear just yet. Just last night, the lower half of downstate Michigan received upwards of four inches of snow in a not uncommon spring storm. The winter storm started in the Kalamazoo and Battle Creek areas and moved throughout the state. Monroe and Lambertville areas received the highest accumulations measuring from four to six inches. However, Michiganers should consider themselves lucky it did not compare to 1923 when the Flint area received 12 inches of snow this late in the season. The snowfall from last night's sprinkle will be in history books as the fifth heaviest late snowstorm in the Detroit area. And after this break, we'll be back with your national and international news. The pandemic has highlighted inequity in healthcare and even widened the gap. While some in America receive cutting edge care, millions go uninsured. It says to me that a lot of people don't care. What lessons can we learn from the rest of the world? No one says, well, that's going to cost too much, so we're not going to do it. There's, there's a basic level of care that people deserve. Critical Care, America versus the world. Tonight at 10 on WNMU-TV. Welcome back. 
More developments have been made in the story of the now paused distribution of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. An FDA probe of the Baltimore factory that was contracted to produce the vaccine found that the factory was dirty, had poorly trained staff, and did not follow proper procedures. This led to materials that were used in the vaccine being contaminated. The FDA and Johnson & Johnson have not released a timeline on when or if it will, how long it will take to resume distribution of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Republican senators in the state of North Carolina have stated they will not be advancing a controversial bill which would have banned transgender procedures for those under the age of 21. Senate Bill 514, which was proposed by three GOP senators, would have also punished doctors who perform the said procedures. LBGTQ advocates in the state are praising the decision to not move forward with the bill, but say more still needs to be done. 53 people are reported missing off the coast of Indonesia after a submarine went missing north of Bali. The Indonesian Navy is searching after KRI Nagala 402 stopped its scheduled reporting calls during a routine training exercise. Their military chief is using hydrographic survey ships as well as submarine rescue vehicles from Australia and Singapore to help rescue the individuals. And after a leak in an oxygen tank supply line, 22 COVID patients on ventilators died in western India this morning. According to police, there was a leak in the pipes connecting the oxygen supply to the main tank at the hospital. The district collector Siraj Manhar claims the oxygen supply has since been resumed to other patients. And protests have given way in celebration after Minneapolis after the murder conviction of former police officer Derek Chauvin and the death of George Floyd. And now the U.S. Justice Department has launched an investigation. Skylar Henry has a story from Minneapolis. Derek Chauvin is in a maximum security prison in Minnesota waiting for his sentencing in about eight weeks. Judge Peter Cahill could give the former officer up to 40 years for murdering George Floyd. Unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Chauvin's conviction on all three counts Tuesday after less than 10 hours of deliberations sparked celebrations in Minneapolis and across the nation. I just thank God for Minnesota for the truth. Guilty and guilty I was excited, I was happy, because African-American people, we feel that we never get justice. And residents may see more justice. The U.S. Attorney General is opening an investigation into policing practices in Minneapolis. It will include a comprehensive review of the Minneapolis Police Department's policies, training, supervision, and use of force investigations. There's obvious relief here in Minneapolis, but for many, convictions are not enough. They want change, especially in how police treat people in communities of color. Police, the way they just pull black people over just for no reason sometimes, and just because they think they are a threat, but they're not a threat. The three other officers who were at the scene when Floyd died are expected to go to trial in August for aiding and abetting. Chauvin reportedly wrote his lawyer's phone number on his hand before being taken into custody. Skyler Henry, CBS News, Minneapolis. We're adjourned. Just hours before the verdict was read in the Derek Chauvin trial, a black teenager in Ohio was shot and killed by the police. They were responding to a call of a potential stabbing. CBS News' Lauren Podesta shows the video of what led up to the deadly use of force. We want to warn you, it is difficult to watch. Officials in Columbus, Ohio, released body camera footage just hours after a black teenager in the city was shot and killed by an officer. Columbus police say they were responding to a 911 caller who said someone was trying to stab them. We think it's critically important to share as much information as possible. Police say 16-year-old Michaela Bryant was trying to stab two people with a knife. The officer fires and Bryant falls to the ground. The teen was later pronounced dead at the hospital. Deadly force can be used to protect uh, yourself or the protection of a third person. So that is within the policy and that was in, it, within the law. That is the, what the law says. Whether this complies with that will be part of that investigation. But that claim of protection of the two other women did not stop protesters from taking to the streets into the night to demand justice for Bryant's life. Officials are calling for calm while the incident is investigated. It's unclear who started the initial fight or who called police. Laura Podesta, CBS News. The matter is now in the hands of the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. The police chief says the officer in question is being put on administrative leave. Stay with us because after this break, we will be back with weather and sports.
Saturday night at 8 on WNMU TV. I'm back. I'm Nate Jacobs and I'm back with your weather. As you can see behind me, it's a little bit cloudy today and a little bit sprinkling on our students walking to class at Northern Michigan. And moving ahead, it's partly cloudy right now. Temperature is 33, winds north at 9 miles per hour, and the barometric pressure is 30.9 and falling. And tonight, it's going to be cloudy with a low of 26, and the winds are west-southwest at 9 miles per hour. And looking ahead to tomorrow, it's going to be sunny with a high of 50, and winds north-northwest also at 9 miles per hour. And right now, it is 34 degrees in Sault Ste. Marie. It is 35 in Manistique. It is 34 in Escanaba, and it is 35 in Menominee. Moving across the board, we got 38 in Iron Mountain, 32 in Ironwood, 36 in Houghton, and 33 in beautiful Marquette. And you guessed it, it's cloudy across the board. And looking ahead, we've got on Friday a high of 59 and a low of 37 with some clouds. Saturday, it might rain. It's got a high of 42, a low of 29. And on Sunday, it's looking good with some sun. High of 41 and a low of 35. And now, we've got Max with some sports for us. Thank you, Nate. Due to the aforementioned snowstorm that last night swept across lower Michigan, the Detroit Tigers had yesterday's game with the Pittsburgh Pirates postponed due to snow. The game was called about two hours before first pitch as snow began falling in Detroit and was expected to continue to fall throughout the evening. The Tigers will have to make that game up today as they take on the Pirates in a seven-inning doubleheader. Michael Fulmer was scheduled to start in the series opener yesterday and got the nod for the start today, while Spencer Turnbull will make his season debut in Game 2. Game 1 is underway with the Tigers trailing the Pirates 3-2 in the top of the seventh inning, while first pitch for Game 2 is set for 6:40 this evening. It was a rough night for the Detroit Red Wings last night, who dropped their second game in as many nights, 5-2, to the Dallas Stars. Dallas exploded out of the gate, netting three goals in the first period. And just 3.36 into the second period, the Stars went up 4 to nothing on a Jamie Oleksiak goal that sent Jonathan Bernier to the bench after letting in those four goals on just 12 shots. Thomas Grice replaced him and made 11 saves. With their wins the past two nights, the Dallas Stars have pulled within one point of the Nashville Predators for the final playoff spot from the Central Division. It will be an uphill battle to take the spot over the Preds, however, as the Stars will finish their season with nine of their 11 final games on the road, including two more with the Red Wings in Detroit, the first of which tomorrow at 7.30. And the FIDE Candidates Tournament continued with round 10 today, all but one game ending in a draw. In the day's only decisive game, Russian Grandmaster Jan Nepomyshy tightened his grip on first place by playing an impressive game with the white pieces, opting for the English opening against fellow Russian Grandmaster Kirill Alexenko and grinding the game down to a winning queen and opposite color bishop endgame where Nepo was up two pawns. Even more impressively, Nepo achieved his victory in just 31 moves and still had over an hour on his clock to Alexenko's less than a minute when he resigned the game. With the win, Nepo now stands a full point above the field. He's in first place with six and a half points out of ten. Fabiano Caruana, Maxime Lachir Vagrab, and Anish Giri are right behind him with five and a half points each with four rounds still to play. Well, Nate, it's a... Uh, Fascinating weather situation downstate. It's messing up the Detroit Tigers, and I hear your New York Mets are having a rough go of it as well. Yeah, Max, they're playing in Chicago right now, and it's a little chilly for their game last night, so we'll see how it goes today. But uh, unfortunately, I'd like to say this is my last show, but I want to say thank you to everyone down here at the studio. Thank you for the wonderful memories, the wonderful experience, and thank you guys for tuning in every day. From everyone down here, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you tomorrow. The preceding program was produced by WNMU-TV, Northern Michigan University Public Television, and studios located in Elizabeth and Edgar Hardin Hall.